One of our major focus right now is the Legacy Cities Initiative. This initiative is a national network of community and government leaders working to create shared prosperity and bring attention to the common needs and collective importance of legacy cities. The initiative promotes sustainable and equitable revitalization by convening stakeholders, facilitating the exchange of ideas and practices and researching and advancing new policy of PFR in the works that's to be released later this year, um, Greening America's Smaller Legacy Cities, where our webinar series has stemmed from and can be available on our site, legacycities.org. I will also take this time to mention another exciting project that we're working on, our Legacy Cities Community of Practice. This is an 18-month program that brings together interdisciplinary teams from four cities to gain deeper understanding of local land use issues and implement solutions through place-based projects in disinvested neighborhoods. The program is going to focus on equity, greening, network building, data, and metrics, and it'll provide participants with the opportunity to join a growing network of legacy city community and government leaders. Applications will open on our site this Thursday, July 14th, until September 16th, um, and our official program launch will begin in January 2023. And now for our webinar, just a few housekeeping reminders. The chat is disabled, but we do welcome you to use the Q&A function and we'll review and try to answer your questions after our speakers have presented for the day. I will now pass it over to Rafe Larson, founder of Future of Small Cities Institute. Rafe. Thank you, Libertad. Um, hi, my name is Rafe Larson. I'm the director of the Future of Small Cities Institute. And we're really excited to be working with the Lincoln Institute for Land Policy on this ongoing series uh, about greening small cities. Our first event was back in March uh, and we heard from one of the contributors of the Green Inventory Project that I'm sure we'll be talking about today, Catherine Tumber, who's also author of the seminal Small Gritty and Green, kind of the OG of uh, greening small cities texts. Um, and she was in conversation with Luis Aguirre's Torres, who's a sustainability coordinator for the city of Ethica who talked about all the really exciting uh, decarbonization strategies that they're doing on a mass scale there and, and the huge benefits to the green workforce. Um, you can find that a recap of that event on our website. I'll put that in the chat. The second event in the series, uh, Greening on the Ground, looked at climate resilience and the good work that Groundwork USA is doing um, in several neighborhoods, including in Elizabeth, New Jersey and Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And now this is the third installment um, on climate justice action in small cities. It's something that often gets sort of lost in the capacity gap of small cities. So I'm really eager to hear about the work uh, that's going on today. Um, our case study city is Providence, Rhode Island, which I'm continually fascinated by. It's a small to mid-sized city, but often punches above its weight um, due to being the capital and the kind of the spiritual center of Rhode Island. It has a rich history of manufacturing, a hugely diverse population, a lot of waterfront space strong neighborhoods uh, and a parallel academic community um, and is well connected to other metros. So it has all these really interesting tailwinds and collision points um, that give it a kind of unique e ecosystem that I think we'll hear about today uh, for some of the climate justice work that's going on. So I'm excited, excited to learn a ton. I also went to school there. So uh, it's great to see how the city has evolved over the last 20 years. Uh, our fearless moderator uh, for today uh, will be Joe Schilling. Uh, he's also one of the co-authors of the Green Inventory Report. Joe is a senior policy and research associate in the Research to Action Lab and Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy, Cent policy Center at the Urban Institute. Um, state and local governments serve as the primary platform for his research, uh, poly policy translation and technical assistance engagements that help cross-sector leaders assess, adapt, and transfer innovative policies and practices. Over the past decade, Joe has worked with legacy cities, leaders from Youngstown and Cleveland to Flint and Detroit, cultivating innovative green re regeneration strategies from greening vacant lots to housing preservation and strategic code enforcement. In 2020, he and co-author Gabby Velasco completed the, the land policy working paper that we'll hear about today, the Green Inventory Project, which explores promising sustainability plans, policies, and programs in small to mid-sized legacy cities. So Joe, take it away. Many thanks, Rafe, I appreciate it. I never thought of moderating as being a fearless task, but uh, you know, I'm up for the challenge. Uh, so as, as Rafe mentioned, uh, our team uh, with Catherine Tumber and Gabby Velascos uh, at the Urban Institute, we have spent the last roughly two years 
exploring some of the exciting things that are going on in small to mid-sized legacy cities and identifying a wide range of concrete policies, plans, programs, projects, and practices that we affectionately call the five Ps, uh, that legacy cities are at some point in their sustainability journey trying to take these five Ps and put them in play to address what we have identified as a, as a really pivotal policy intersection. And that's where <clears throat> we're talking about climate resilience, we're talking about environmental justice, racial equity, and green economic development. Because it's really this critical juncture that we view for uh, any community is uh, sort of the sweet spot in order to advance a more prosperous, uh, healthy and equitable future. And as the research has shown, the effects of climate change is overlaid on what's already uh, racial disparities, health disparities, there were communities of color will continue to suffer really the most from climate changes, excessive urban heat, flooding, uh, poor, quality, poor air and water quality, and other environmental and economic harms. And against this backdrop, you know, for smaller to mid-sized cities, they may not have the same capacity that, say, a Boston or a Chicago or San Francisco might have when it comes to addressing the intersection of climate resilience, environmental justice, and green economic development. But as part of our search has identified, there are some very promising and innovative plans out there that bring all of these uh, themes together. And that's what we identified here in, in Providence. And you know, planning itself provides a great um, way to connect across these different important policy domains but more importantly, planning itself is really a process about engaging and, and empowering communities. And so that's what we will hear about today. So our program will be kind of in two consecutive parts. Uh, we encourage you to use the Q&A function uh, as you hear the presentations and we'll try to address as many of those questions uh, as possible. But our first part is really the Providence story, as Rafe has outlined, you know, the context of Providence. So we'll be led uh, through the Providence story by Emily Koo, who's currently the Director of Sustainability for the City of Providence, and started uh, working for the city 10 years ago as a mayoral fellow. Uh, she will be joined by Elder Gonzalez Trejo, who also worked as a fellow in his uh, career. Uh, and again, understanding the relationship of wildlife conservation uh, and uh, the coast. So he was able to sort of leverage that with some time in the Bay Area uh, that brought him back home to Providence. Uh, and is now part of the Office of Sustainability. And then after they illustrate sort of the, the Providence story, uh, we will hear from Leah Bamberger, who is now uh, at the Northeastern University as director of their Climate Justice and Sustainability Hub. Uh, but prior to that, she was in Emily's position as the director of sustainability. But now in this new position at Northeastern University has an opportunity to sort of expand and apply some of the lessons that she has learned uh, through her Providence experience to other communities and other contexts. So she will help uh, put the Providence story in a slightly broader context. So with that, I will pass it on to Leah and Elder to 
take us through the Providence story. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for having us. Um, I'll just start to share my screen for the PowerPoint. All right, thumbs up on the PowerPoint. Hi everyone, as uh, Joseph mentioned, my name is Emily Ku. I'm the uh, director of the department or office of sustainability. Elder, if you'd like to introduce yourself as well. Hello everyone, my name is Elder Gonzalez Trejo and I am the sustainability policy associate with the department of sustainability at the city of Providence. And thanks again to the Lincoln Institute, the Future Small Cities Institute, and the Urban Institute for having us. Um, and of course, to all the attendees for your interest in the work that we're doing here at uh, the City of Providence. So wanted to start by offering just some context on the history and structure of our particular municipal sustainability office in the City of Providence, uh, where the capital of Rhode Island and our population is just under 200,000. So the establishment of the office uh, happened 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago in 2011, when Providence's first director of sustainability uh, was funded and hired um, and set up shop in City Hall with two reassigned energy managers. So the position had been established in 2008 by the city council, but it wasn't funded. Um, until 2011, and it was funded with energy efficiency, uh, federal energy efficiency funds. And the office really did begin by focusing on reducing energy expenditures and developing a comprehensive sustainability action plan, as many city um, sustainability offices do. Uh, in those 10 years, our energy managers have certainly served that purpose. They've saved the city tens of millions of dollars over the past 10 years. And our office has also come a long way since the release of that first climate action plan called Sustainable Providence in 2014. So in, as I mentioned in 2014, um, well, uh, the Sustainable Providence plan was our traditional climate action plan that was released in 2014. Uh, since then, the uh, mayor that um, is concluding his um, second term right now as mayor, Mayor Jorge Alorza, both committed Providence to becoming a carbon neutral city by 2050, and also began to apply a racial equity lens to the work uh, that our office um, does. And so this um, included understanding the effects of personal and institutional racism and establishing the Racial and Environmental Justice Committee. And in the years that followed um, in working, uh, we'll go into a bit more detail, but in working and partnering with the Racial Environmental Justice Committee, we developed this vision for a low carbon future based on the 2015 goal that centers frontline communities and culminated in the release of the Climate Justice Plan in 2019. So I'll offer just some more details and context on the shift in approach and process that led us from the Sustainable Providence Plan in 2014 to the Climate Justice Plan in 2019. Um, and just to revisit this, you can, um, it's interesting to see uh, the different categories and um, when different folks were at the table, um, how our way that we approach climate change, both mitigation and adaptation, um, may center more on housing and community health, for example. So, uh, one aspect of the shift towards applying a racial equity lens and centering frontline communities is called the targeted universalism approach. So this is a photo of the OXO vegetable peeler and uh, the designer of this peeler, his mother had arthritis and was having trouble using the metal peeler on the right. And so um, he designed um, a peeler that was better for his mother and uh, it was also better for everyone to use on the far left here. And so uh, the takeaway uh, from this example is that oftentimes in policy, we try to design solutions that meet the needs or capture the most people in their response. But with a targeted universalism approach, if we design for folks at the margin, 
we create better solutions for everyone. So overall, the work is going to be better by centering those that are most impacted. So that's our approach in the climate justice plan. And uh, this began with a process of trust building and um, it's called the Equity and Sustainability Initiative. Um, this was uh, during Leah's time as director and it began with developing the Racial and Environmental Justice Committee um, that was made up of frontline community members and they did the work to assess the needs and priorities of communities of color related to environmental sustainability. Um, their first step was creating a document that we now call the Just Providence Framework that <clears throat> created the recommendations for a just and equitable providence. And the structure of having kind of a community body that was um, connected to contractually and just relationally to a city department and office like the Office of Sustainability was that they would work together with the officials in that office to integrate the voices and concerns of the frontline communities in the decision-making process. So that's been an ongoing partnership um, with the RAJC and so that's something that's been really critical to this work. So um, this is uh, straight from the Climate Justice Plan, excerpts from that just Providence framework, themes of shifting decision-making power over environmental justice and sustainability issues to Providence's frontline communities, it rejects the typical input model of community engagement. And as I mentioned, creates space for frontline community members to be the decision makers. There's also significant attention given to removing barriers to participation and an explicit focus on trust building. So this new model of community engagement is reflected in um, spectrum of community engagement to ownership, which uh, was kind of adapted for, uh, for Providence. Uh, and shout out to the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, which um, I understand supported a lot of this work as well. Um, so this acknowledges that marginalization is the status quo practice of current systems, such as local government, historically designed to exclude low income or community of, communities of color or youth or other members of the community, non-English speakers. Um, and it suggests that we as government play a critical role in cultivating community capacity and participation in these systems and in decreasing disproportionate harm. So I really like including and revisiting the spectrum pretty regularly in our work to be critical about where we are in the spectrum and how we are engaging with community. Um, in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, this is another snapshot from the Climate Justice Plan, and it's just the process that helped develop the Climate Justice Plan. Um, it, again, began with our relationship and the creation of the Racial and Environmental Justice Committee, uh, the Energy Democracy Community Leaders Program, uh, trained frontline community members at, to learn about Providence's energy system and the concepts of energy democracy. And then with those organizing and base building skills, those community leaders then went out and conducted interviews with community members of color to understand how they experienced the current fossil fuel based system in Providence. So um, really like the basic questions that are asked here. Um, how do you keep warm in the winter? How do you keep cool in the summer? What do you like about that? What would you change? How do you get around the city? What's good about that? What would you change? Um, and then is there anything in the community that's making you sick? And then um, the uh, kind of final step, at least in developing the plan, was being able to uh, allow the project team to take that feedback, identify key priorities and concerns, and begin to formulate potential policies that would be responsive to those community priorities. And then in order to return to community members with solutions and then receive additional feedback or direction, so it's an iterative process, um, the initial policies and actions were presented alongside um, stories with the perspective of future residents of Providence. Uh, and this helped community members and honestly, policymakers help visualizes 
uh, visualize how their communities could change depending on the policies and actions being presented. Um, and I really appreciate um, this aspect of the plan and this resource that we have to offer our vision in a, um, in a different format. So the results, resulting document, Providence's Climate Justice Plan, um, includes seven categories, um, ranging from collaborative governance and accountability, housing, community health, local and regenerative economy, um, as well as clean energy and transportation. The goals and strategies of the Climate Justice Plan really have become the guiding document for our department. And to an extent, um, the starting point for a work plan for our department. And as a team, we continue to learn and practice what it means to implement and refine the vision of the plan in collaboration with community. So acknowledging that community is not a monolith and that accountability is key. And just the fact that we have this plan and we appreciate the process that went into it um, we want to make sure that the implementation of what's in that plan um, also continues to engage community. So I'll pass it off to my colleague Elder, who will um, go into some more details about specific examples. Hello, everyone. All right, so now I'm going to share a little bit about our current initiatives, beginning with collaborative governance and accountability. And again, the Providence Climate Justice Plan continues to serve as the guiding document for all of our work. As mentioned in the collaborative governance and accountability section, establishing green justice zones in frontline communities is crucial if we are to use this model. Green justice zones are community controlled decision making entities involved in planning, permitting, development, and other processes. The only real neighborhood and the neighborhoods that surround the Port of Providence have been selected as areas to focus on reparative action due to cumulative air, soil, and water pollution. Green justice zones seek to achieve health equity, improve quality of life, and climate resilience in frontline communities. Next slide, please. So from some of our green justice work with community and city advocates came the Public Street Waterfront Access Project. The Green Port Initiative is a plan that addresses the negative health impacts that derive from toxic land use in the port, um, but it also aims to increase the positive benefit of the port for neighboring communities. We identified two waterfront neighborhoods, um, both of which endure high levels of industrial land use, air pollution, and childhood asthma. Public Street is one of the very few waterfront access points for these communities, so it was and is uh, important that we transform this site into a meaningful public gathering space that also includes stormwater control features and features that protect native species, uh, wildlife, and coastal ecosystems, uh, ecosystems. If you look to the left of the slide, you'll notice a timeline of our work, starting with community advocacy and engagement in 2020. At this time, the city contracted an artist in residence, Fatima Maswood, and uh, they facilitated community engagement. This space was designated a public right of way, July of 2021, and a site analysis and recommendation report was prepared by Fatima Massward, uh, which offered a preliminary conceptual design based on the site research and engagement with, with residents. This report was prepared last year and a review committee was formed to help develop an RFP and later review proposals to select a vendor for the public street design. We were very intentional in selecting and I would say curating the committee uh, members uh, for, for the review process. Uh, and the committee members included folks from the Racial Environmental Justice Committee, the City Planning Department, and other stakeholders who have worked closely with community residents to develop a unified vision for the space. Last month, we uh, very excitedly awarded the vendor for the public street design, and public street construction and maintenance is set to begin uh, in 2023. Next slide, please. So now we'll talk about some of the current initiatives uh, regarding community health. The community health section of the plan calls for the city to create the conditions for healthy air and community spaces free from pollution for all Providence residents, uh, with a focus specifically in the poor area and other communities facing the highest rates of pollution. A key strategy to achieve this, uh, this objective is to explore zoning 
and land use policy changes. This month, we awarded a consultant to provide expertise in zoning and lead a process that would result in the preparation of an amendment to the city's zoning ordinance. The proposals received were reviewed by an evaluation committee comprised of members of the Department of Sustainability, the Racial and Environmental Justice Committee, the Department of Planning and Development, the Sustainability Commission, and from an academic institution actively working on air quality research. Next slide, please. And so resilience hubs fall under, again, the community health category of our climate justice plan. And our climate justice plan calls for a network of resilience hub net, uh, locations across the city. For folks unfamiliar with the concept of a resilience hub, a resilience hub is a community serving facility that would support residents before, during, or after an environmental and natural hazard. And it would assist and support residents by providing a number of resources and other services that align with the need of the community. Uh, we must understand that a resilience hub will look different in different neighborhoods, different towns, cities, and different states. And at the moment, we are developing a criteria for a resilience hub and creating tiers that would define site capacity and ability. Some examples of the resources and services that we have compiled for our Providence Resilience Hub include utility assistance, home improvement and weatherization assistance, uh, food bank and storage, power center, access to electricity, heating and cooling center, emergency preparedness kits, uh, which include misting nets, first aid kits, uh, health equity and environmental justice programs and projects that focus on education and community engagement. Some of the next steps include identifying potential sites and implementing a strategic plan uh, that would include hiring a resilience coordinator. For our next current initiatives, we're gonna focus on our category lead by example. And so one of the, the goals of the PBD tree plan and listen, the climate justice plan is to partner with community organizations to expand and improve these green spaces. And so the, TV, uh, the PVD tree plan is a collaborative project for an equitable distributed urban forest in Providence. And the plan will ensure equitable distribution of trees across our city, facilitate collaborative governance on green infrastructure planning, center the voices of black, brown and indigenous community members impacted by a low tree canopy, pilot new community driven planting and stewardship projects and recommend new strategies, programs, policies and funding streams. Lastly, for our current initiative under clean energy, our objective is to transition to 50% carbon free electricity by 2035 and 100% carbon free electricity by 2050 with a focus on local regenerative, uh, pardon me, local generation and equitable access. For folks that are familiar with community choice aggregation, it allows local governments to procure power on behalf of the residents, businesses, mm -hmm. and municipal accounts from an alternative supplier while still receiving transmission and distribution service from their existing utility provider. This tends to be an attractive option for communities that want more local control over their electricity sources, this means greener power that is offered by the default utility and or lower electricity prices. By aggregating demand, communities gain leverage to negotiate better rates with competitive suppliers and choose greener power sources. As the city sought to build on its inclusive approach, it centered efforts on those negatively impacted by our current electricity system. From this effort derived a group of 12 community advisors, all participants from diverse backgrounds representing a range of neighborhoods and demographics across the city of Providence. The advisors provided input, feedback, and connection to the communities by co-developing a series of four educational videos and an accompanying survey, uh, survey. The videos were recorded in English and Spanish and were designed to provide community members with a highly accessible introduction to this sort of program, its goals and potential impact on residents and businesses in Providence. The initial results indicated that majority support across all income levels uh, for including renewable energy in their electricity supply, and it could pay about the same amount as one pays today. The community advisors met with the municipality and aggregation consultant to discuss how the results would be reflected in the draft plan. 
We hope to continue using this community advisor model as we implement the PVD community electricity and to develop other programming with our rescue fund dollars. And I'll pass it over to Emily again. Thanks. Yeah, and some great related questions in the chat. Um, we did compensate the original Energy Democracy Leaders Program, compensating um, programs such as um, that community advisors as we develop specific programs. Um, and, uh, oops, sorry, I'm having trouble with the advancing times. Um, just some general reflections uh, on this work. Uh, this was a question that was posed to me that, that still resonates in thinking about uh, whether we identify as public servants or bureaucrats and when and why the priorities of government may or may not align with community. So ideally as public servants, uh, success for government aligns with the success for community, but often that's not the case. Uh, city government is a big racist siloed institution and we have complex processes and systems that seek to maintain the status quo, centralize power and center whiteness. Uh, and so while we seek to serve the people of Providence in mission, uh, and we can point to a number, any number of limitations and barriers that prevent us from doing so. And the re reality is, um, it's helpful to continually return to this, is that the system, whether it's the system of local government or engagement, um, is deeply designed to be inequitable and it's serving that purpose. Um, something that came to mind based on some of the questions in the chat is um, our uh, city and specifically an African-American ambassadors group over the past two years um, has done some really important work digging into uh, the history, um, a kind of a truth-telling process of African heritage and indigenous people in Providence. And as a, um, it's called the Matter of Truth Report, um, and it's feeding into our kind of like truth telling, reconciliation and reparations process. Um, and so um, just as a team, I think it's really important for us to continue to learn from that work and um, be able to acknowledge um, the power um, that we're working within. Elder, if you'd like to add anything. Yeah, I would just add that at least with my lived experience growing up in, in Providence and, and understanding my identity, uh, I, I think that government was created to serve its people and just historically this institution uh, and its structures have proven to be racist. In our office, we understand that government will simply not succeed if its communities not reflect that success as well. And therefore we prioritize the needs of these marginalized residents and communities um, of our city to address the inequities that exist. And in kind of responding to some of the questions about what are the barriers we've seen? How do we overcome them? Uh, what do we need? It was really helpful for me to revisit this document um, by Tema Kuhn called um, Characteristics of White Supremacy Culture. Uh, and really, I, it's very easy to make the connections between the barriers that we face um, and the antidotes to those barriers. So uh, for example, having very transactional relationships in the way that we um, respond to community or implement policies, um, silos, even within city departments, um, different visions and approaches to engagement and equity uh, between departments. Um, having a lot of different reports and committees that may be kind of circling around the same themes, but work in isolation and don't build on each other's work. Um, de demystifying the, many of those complex processes like procurement to help them serve both as a, as a department and also for the benefit of community. Um, considering how policy best practices may or may not align with community needs and priorities. And when those uh, may not align, um, how to choose the best path. Um, and then I think something that resonates with um, 
you know, a lot of people, not only in the government sector, but nonprofit sector, and I'm sure all sectors, is just urgency and scarcity. So just, you know, many excuses for um, not having the time or resources for community building, for capacity building, uh, for that extra collaboration and transparency, um, really just being in survival mode and perhaps even just needing to respond to funders, focusing on funder-driven deliverables, showing the impact of um, the work that you're doing with taxpayer funding. Um, and so uh, antidotes to some of those barriers are just building trust, shared understanding and commitments. Really something that's really drilled home for me lately is just sustaining, caring, holistic relationships and taking the time to see and acknowledge each other as humans in order to establish that trust, especially when there's no time to do so. Um, clarity and alignment for action, when mentioning some of those silos and uh, even just within city departments, having really more realistic timeframes that make space for things that come up. Um, and then focusing on the depth and quality of meaningful engagement and how our goals can be less transactional and more transformational. Um, Elder, any final kind of additions to our reflections? Yeah, I would just add to what we need uh, patience. You know, I think that we, a lot of organizations, including ourselves, our department, are taking on a bottom-up approach versus a top-down approach. And deferring to community is not something that we can ask of residents who have just historically been marginalized for so long, adapted to the conditions they're living in. Uh, there's a lack of empowerment that exists there. And so having a patience uh, and putting forth that effort to, conti to continue the ball rolling is, is crucial when, if, if we want to, to secure a seat for community residents and if we want to provide um, the resources that these residents need to, to make these informed decisions uh, collaboratively. Great, thank you, Emily and Elder. We have a couple of minutes and a couple of questions, um, maybe just building on what you just mentioned Elder is one of our attendees was wondering, despite some of your best efforts, right? What, has there been any sort of backlash from sort of the traditional, you know, sort of power structure and institutions as you kind of shift, or maybe there's, you know, some reaction like, oh, you know, our systems aren't racially uh, structured, you know, this, it's all, you know, or anyway, I mean, sometimes these are difficult conversations, particularly for those of us who have been the benefits of white privilege, but, you know, have there been any sort of resistance uh, from those in power or local institutions? Uh um. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll provide just a little bit and then I'll let Emily add some additional information, but just within some of the departments that exist in, in our municipality, uh, there's a, a way, a process to abide by. And some of these colleagues or folks, staff members that, live, uh, that work for the municipality just don't understand how that process is just innately racist. And so having to explain um some of these topics to them and and encourage undoing racism trainings can be a little challenging and when, when our team also just has a very limited capacity and so there's definitely a, a, a bit of push um within within the municipality emily yeah i don't think i need anything thanks elder so there's always a little bit of sort of push and pull, right? You guys are trying to pull folks in these certain directions and sometimes yeah, there's a little resistance. How does gentrification play into this in terms of the work you're doing? I mean, obviously Providence, both um, from a sort of economic perspective is in a much better position than it was you know, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and how does that affect your work and um, you know, particularly as across different departments, you know, that are 
maybe working more directly on issues of gentrification and displacement. Yeah, I mean, that was a huge concern that was raised in the development of the climate justice plan is if we plant more trees, if we make our buildings really energy efficient and solar on them, um, residents saying we're not gonna be able to afford to live here. And we do see the price of rents just going up astronomically. And so um, it's a really important thing to, to center when we try to make these improvements. Um, and it's, it shows in, in our climate justice plan, our planning department also recently developed a specific affordable housing and anti-displacement plan um, with a lot of really important recommendations that honestly we just need more funding and capacity to implement. Um, because I think there is a significant risk that um, making all of these improvements um, are, yeah, are the people that already live here are, aren't gonna be, I think it's a concern for the entire city if, if the people that already live here are gonna be pushed out if we keep, um, you know, if affordability isn't um, under control. Well, definitely a challenge that doesn't have a simple solution, right? So I'm curious when it comes to thinking about Providence as sort of a small to mid-sized city, and you know, what do you think are some of your reflections about some of the things you've put in place that might be relevant for other small or mid-sized cities? Because you talked about green justice zones and resilience hubs and uh, the tree plan, but are there some places if you were just, if you were in a similar size city to Providence, but kind of starting from scratch, where, where would you start? I, well, I've only been with the city for a limited amount of time, about six or seven months, but I think that the climate justice plan you know, creating a strategic plan is this guiding document has undoubtedly helped secure, you know, some of these objectives and strategies and, and I think that's what I, I mean. I think as a lead up to that, it really was um, racial equity trading. I think Leah will go into this more, but it's, you know, we still don't really have everyone on board, even just within our like neighboring departments. Um, but it's super important that our team, um, in order to build trust and relationships with, and to be able to support a group of frontline community members, such as the Racial and Environmental Justice Committee, the base of that was we collectively did undoing racism trainings together to begin to understand um, the structural inequities that were up against um, and then having that group continue to kind of be a guiding source for our office um, and help us develop that climate justice plan and then continue to help implement that. Um, and so we have been in touch with a lot of cities around the country as they begin to develop similar um, groups of residents that are looking to address climate um, in a different way than a traditional climate action plan with those most impacted at the center. Well, that's a great transition uh, for our next speaker is that there is uh, an evolution in this practice, right? I can remember uh, 10 or 15 years ago um, with the sort of launch of the sustainability directors network and people were talking climate action plan, that is the next big thing. And now 10 or 15 years later, we recognize that that was a good start. But, you know, as our sophistication about climate and its impacts uh, on communities of color and the need for justice start to intersect, um, we need to think about slightly different sort of strategies and tools. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Leah Bamberger. And if you did join us late, Leah now is uh, director of the Northeastern University Climate Justice and Sustainability Hub and former director of the Office of Sustainability in Providence. So Leah, it's all yours. 
Thank you. Um, and thank you um, for bringing us together. And it's so nice to hear an update from Emily and Elder on the great work that uh, is happening in Providence. Um, so first, just a little bit about me. Um, important acknowledgement, I, I, I believe, um, to make is that I am white and I am making an assumption here in this presentation that I'm talking to a predominantly white audience um, or um, at least uh, folks who work for uh, predominantly white institutions. Um, BIPOC environmental activists are incredibly important leaders um, in this work. And they are still um, too few in numbers and are often are too often overlooked. So I'm hoping, and my intention here is that by sharing my perspective, um, I can help encourage more white people to support BIPOC communities um, in leading us to a more just and equitable future. Um, also, um, a little bit about uh, how how I got here and and the work that I'm doing and I've done in the past few years. Um, I grew up in a suburb of Boston. It was a predominantly white uh, Catholic Protestant town. Um, I was one of two uh, Jews in my grade and there were only two black students. Um, so it was not a very diverse community, sort of typical suburban um, community. And, um, but however, I, I loved our, our family would often go on trips to Boston or to New York. And um, I love the, culture and the vibrancy um, that city has offered and the community there and saw that as certainly a contrast to my hometown. Um, but uh, one thing that um, my town did offer me was great access to nature and both of these things really shaped my work going forward. Um, and my career really focused on sustainable cities. So thinking about how can people have the best of both worlds from you know, the access to nature and the outdoors and green spaces, um, clean water, air, public transit, smaller carbon footprints, you know, local, locally grown and harvested food, um, and above all, really a culture that recognizes our connection to the natural world, which is so vital to our um, mental, physical, and spiritual well-being. Um, as director of sustainability, starting in for the city of Providence from 2015 to uh, when I left the position in the very beginning of 2022, um, I started to learn in the beginning of that to much of the story that Emily and Elder were sharing, I started to learn a critical piece of the puzzle of how we create more sustainable cities um, that I was missing. And um, that is structural racism. Um, it's a, it is sort of at the root cause of, of the all of these challenges that we're talking about. Um, and so in this work as, as, a, as a planner, as, a, uh, as working in a local government, a practitioner working on sustainable cities, looking around the field um, and my peers in other cities, I realized that most people looked like me and had similar backgrounds as I did. Although many of us, um, the majority of us were serving and working in BIPOC majority um, communities. Um, and this was very much reflective of the environmental field uh, historically and at that time. Um, we knew uh, in the work that there was a need to engage more people and to get more people to care about climate change, but all too often uh, the, work, uh, the work we were doing focused on climate change and not some of these fundamental environmental issues that cities were facing, things like lead poisoning and industrial pollution. Um, these were all deprioritized de over carbon accounting and greenhouse gas reduction measures. And it became work that was best suited for consultants with advanced degrees. Um, so, you know, I like to say we changed a lot of light bulbs, but not a lot of minds during that time. And this is sort of- Are you advancing your slides? I'm sorry to interrupt. Nope, next, I'm about to, but thank you. <laughs> um, and so this this was sort of like early to early to mid, or I guess like two, 2010, um, it was, there's a lot of funding for sustainable cities work under the um, Obama administration. Um, and it was very focused on cities leading the way. So um, I'm going to now try to advance my slides. All right, um, so my experience in Providence, above all, I, I think taught me and helped me refocus environmental work on people. This work is truly about people and we are connected in nature or connected to nature in ways far more complex 
than the basic needs of clean water and clean air. Um, for hundreds of thousands of years, nature has shaped our culture, you know, things like our hunting traditions, agricultural celebrations, the food we eat, um, but it's really only in the last couple hundred years that we've begun to see ourselves as separate from nature. Um, however, our evolutionary biology doesn't know that. Um, and E.O. Wilson explored this um, throughout his career, but really in, in this book that I highly recommend called The Future of Life. Um, so this quote here may sound cliche, but I think it holds deep truths even today. Um, studies have shown that being in nature improves cognitive functioning, including increased concentration, greater attention capacities, and higher academic performance. It also reduces stress, improves social skills, has so many benefits that are really uh, central to human well-being. Um, and there also are still you know, deep ties to our, our culture as well. You know, for me, one example, in the springtime, uh, we would always go to a sugar shack in, in New England, which is where they make maple syrup and you know, big pancake breakfast. And it was such a um, joyful sign of winter concluding and spring um, being, being right around the corner. And I'm sure many of us um, have similar sort of seasonal traditions that really connect us to a place and connect us to nature. This here is a picture of um, a hiking trip with my, my niece and my dog uh, a year ago. Um, so the point here is that as we, when we destroy nature, we are destroying and harming a part of our livelihood, our well-being, and our community. Um, we are losing a lot more than, you know, just a, a couple trees or, you know, a species that is going extinct. This really has fundamental impacts on, on humanity. And indigenous cultures, past and present, uh, profoundly understand this. So, you know, the inverse is also true. Um, when we take part in the healing of our environment, we begin to heal ourselves and our communities. Uh, Robin Wall Kimmer brings this concept to light in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. Action on behalf of life transforms, she says, because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal. It is not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. So by making environmental work, the work of consultants, designers, and engineers, by condensing it to a carbon equation to be solved by technology, we're perpetuating an extractive system that silences and excludes BIPOC communities all over the world. The reality is that we can solve climate change today. We have the technology, we have renewable energy, heat pumps, composting, sustainable agriculture, um, but all of this needs to, to scale and people need to be empowered to act. So this brings um, to light, I think, an important truth that um, a functioning democracy is absolutely fundamental to stopping the exploitation of people and the planet. You know, Emily and Elder talked a lot about the importance of decision making um, and sharing power, and that really gets to this point. Um, also, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, is also a, 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 an example of how autocracies and fossil fuels go hand in hand. Um, Bill McKibben, a couple months ago, had a great article published both in The Guardian and the Boston Globe about this. And, and he wrote that uh, the crucial thing about oil and gas is that it is concentrated in a few spots around the world. And hence the people who live on top of or otherwise control those spots end up with huge amounts of unwarranted and unaccountable power. And it's that power that is um, very problematic. So um, really the point I'm making is that people don't need to be enlightened or saved by climate experts. Uh, they need to be part of the solution and everyone must have the opportunity to act to heal and to be healed. Um, so not only has racism caused BIPOC communities to bear a disproportionate share of the harm associated with environmental degradation, but it's also getting in the way of allowing these communities to be part of the solution. All across the US, BIPOC communities are disproportionately burdened by pollution. There's so many studies um, that are, are, are showing this, um, one of which is a 2021 study by researchers at the Center for Air, Climate and Energy Solutions, which found that people of color in the United States breathe more particulate air pollution. The study's findings hold across all income levels in all regions of the country. These are also the same communities that have been disenfranchised by our voting system, um, segregated through redlining, and then displaced by gentrification. 
Environmental justice is about practicing good democracy. So these communities have a say and a role in their own health and environment. It is also about easing the burden of systemic oppression so these communities can heal and the planet can heal with them. Um, engaging in environmental justice work as a professional, whether as an elected official, an urban planner, or an advocate, means engaging inwards and doing this deep personal work. It means committing to racial equity training and learning, building authentic relationships with frontline communities following their leadership and being responsive to the unique set of circumstances, people, history, environment um, of any given place. And I'll explore um, these concepts more deeply in the slides to follow, but I do wanna point out that this is absolutely not a linear step-by-step -step process. It's an ongoing process. And as you go, you learn things in one area that help you understand more deeply another area. Um, and perhaps the most, important lesson um, and takeaway for me, and I hope for you too, is that you know this work needs to start now and, and now really is the best time to start, start if you haven't already. It doesn't have to be part of your job description or your organization's mission. It certainly wasn't part of mine. Um, and there is room and need for this work everywhere. Um, I'm also particularly, um, I think there's a, ha having this conversation in the context of small cities um, is exciting to me because I think there is a unique opportunity uh, with small cities to engage in this work because it is much easier to practice good democracy and build relationships um, and move towards consensus in, in smaller numbers. Um, and I think that was certainly an important um, advantage for us in Providence. So this first sort of lesson and takeaway here is around committing to racial equity training and learning. And, and I think you know, the segue from Emily and the question was great. Um, it, it, was, it was a very important part of how this work started in Providence. Um, and that was in particular, it was a People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. It was an undoing racism workshop, which um, I think the Office of Sustainability has hosted at least three. Um, I've, attended at least three. And it's a two and a half day intensive uh, in-person workshop. And um, it gave me a great foundation for the work and really jump-started transformation for me personally. Um, and the, one of the benefits is that it's done in communities. So you start to build a network of community um, doing this work. And um, that's important because this work is hard and it's, it never ends. And really having that community of support um, that uh, you, you know, through building through this practice can help you um, continue and, and provide the support that you need. I still meet regularly with a group uh, from the workshop. Emily is, is a part of that. <laughs> and we talk about the challenges that we're facing doing this work within our institutions, our organizations, and um, support each other. We push ourselves to stay in the work. Um, and uh, that accountability and community is, is really important. The other benefit of learning in community is that it contextualizes the work to the people in the place that you're doing the work. So you start to build relationships and learn more about the community in which you're working. Um, this work absolutely looks different everywhere um, because the issues differ. And understanding the local history of racism, immigration, labor movements, et cetera, um, in your particular place is very valuable. Um, there are of course general themes across the US. So it's important to learn about racism and its history in the country. Um, and not just the history of slavery or the Ku Klux Klan, but about how racism shows up in every major institution in this country and in all of us. So if you're new to this work, um, you might, like I did, resist the notion that um, you may hold racist views or been taught racist things. Um, but it's helpful to understand that these are so embedded in our society and we're taught them at such a young age. Um, we really have to be intentional about undoing that learning. Um, so, um, you know, there are plenty of research, uh, uh, resources out there, book clubs, um, you know, Surge, Standing Up for Racial Justice is a, is a great uh, research as well. Um, and I would just say that, um, Keep in mind that this learning and unlearning process is truly a lifelong practice. 
as I mentioned, I've, I've done the Undoing Racism three times at this point. And every time I attend that workshop, um, my understanding deepens and I meet more people doing this work. Um, and uh, I find that so helpful. So second is um, building relationships. And I, I uh, like the expression, go deep to go far. Um, when Providence uh, Sustainability Office started this work, it established the Racial Environmental Justice Committee that Emily mentioned. And that was a very small group of Providence frontline community members. Uh, they were convened by a third party facilitator and paid to lead the work. Um, and uh, that small group um, is a pretty tight knit group of dedicated individuals who collaborate with the city on an ongoing basis. Um, and it really started because of a nascent relationship between um, the Office of Sustainability and uh, a board member at the um, at the time it was the Rhode Island Environmental or the Environmental Justice League of Rhode Island. Um, so again, it can start very small. You can start with it was coffee, like we you know we we met for coffee and um, started decided to apply for a grant and blah blah blah, and, and it just sort of snowballs. Um, so. And there's always pressure, you know, the question were there challenges about power structures, like there's always pressure to open up the process. And, and of course, for me and my training as a planner and thinking about inclusive processes, you don't necessarily think about having a small intentional sort of exclusive group doing the work, but that was absolutely necessary to um, really center the voices of frontline communities who are so often marginalized, especially when you have a traditional sort of wide open process. Um, one of uh, Adrian Mari Brown's 10 Principles for Emergent Strategy, another book I highly recommend is Small is Good, Small is All, Large is a Reflection of the Small. So again, you don't need hundreds of people in the room um, to do authentic good engagement. You need maybe it's the, the right 10 people. Um, or if only three show up, that's fine too, start there. But um, really focusing on growing authentic relationships instead of filling the room at a public meeting, um, I find very, very helpful. Um, and I guess the last point I want to make is about um, that, you know, it may seem straightforward building relationships, but I actually found that when I would talk about this work um, with other practitioners, they'd be like, well, how do you build relationships? Um, and I think that many professionals in the field aren't necessarily practice in relationship building outside of our usual network, because when you hold decision-making power, you quickly become accustomed to advocates coming to you to tell you what is important to them. And it's, uh, but it's important and it's challenging to really venture out and find the folks that aren't coming to you, that don't have the connections um, and try to build relationships there. And that's how you share power um, and disrupt the status quo. Um, so, oh, and there's also the point about compensating partners. Um, that was very important. And I mentioned the third party facilitator to convene folks um, was really helpful, I think, in the providence process of, of building trust. Um, all right, so this next one, following the leadership of frontline communities. Um, again, this sounds really kind of obvious and straightforward. And I think it's, again, maybe one of those cliche things that we all know, but practicing it, at least I found very challenging when I started. Um, stepping into a role, a leadership role within government, um, it's hard to know when to step back. It's hard to say, okay, um, you, know, you know, hiring community members to really lead the work and not being so involved. Um, is, can be uncomfortable. Um, but I'll never forget in the beginning of the process, we had um, the REJC host some community meetings and uh, I attended one and I just kind of like hung out in the back because I wanted to see what was going on. Um, and the room was packed and they had, uh, you know, people who I had never seen organizing around climate uh, and environmental work. And, um, and I think that's what happens when you step back and, and make space. Um, so that is, is very um, important and I think deceivingly challenging. Um, also being flexible is, is really um, important because the timeline is, you know, you're really moving at the pace of trust, right? And you, you, you need that flexibility um, to shift as necessary. Um, and then lastly, um, 
you know, trusting BIPOC leadership. Um, there's a, a great quote, um, if you don't trust the people, they will become untrustworthy. And uh, again, that's pulled from Adrian Murray Brown's Emergent Strategy uh, book. But um, trusting the leadership is, is, is of, of frontline communities um, and following that leadership is really uh, critical to building relationships and, and growing this work. And so lastly, um, there is no one way. Uh, the process absolutely needs to reflect community. I would often get questions in, in talking about this work, like, all right, well, let's see your you know, process map or how did you do it? And, and there's always a discomfort that I felt with responding to those questions because it seemed like people were looking for, you know, how do I pick up exactly what Providence did and try that in my city? And the, the point is, is that it's going to look different everywhere. Um, and you just have to find those uh, right sort of change agents or catalysts in your community to get the work started. Providence had a certain set of, you know, funding that came along from grants and, and a couple of relationships and, and the circumstances um, that led to this work to happen. Um, and it's going to look different everywhere. Um, I think I said this before, but moving at the pace of trust and having the flexibility to do that is really important. And knowing that you're going to make mistakes. Um, and I certainly did that plenty, um, but it's also a sign of progress and growth um, for you personally and, and for the work. So if you're not making mistakes, then um, you know, you, you're um, maybe perhaps getting in the way of, of your growth. Um, so, and sort of as I wrap up here, I just wanted to kind of give an example of how I'm, I'm personally applying this work and the lessons I've learned to my new role here at Northeastern's Climate Justice and Sustainability Hub. Um, I, we've developed uh, four sort of draft goals that, that we're working on thinking about how Northeastern can really be um, working towards climate justice um, in, in, our, in our communities. Um, and you know the climate justice and sustainability hub is is a evolution of our of our office of sustainability here at Northeastern, but it's also about uh, moving towards connecting research and practice and community engagement and how can our campuses both in Boston and throughout our global network really be working in service to climate justice and sustainability uh, goals. So certainly. Um, we want our campuses to be models of healthy, sustainable, inclusive communities. We're exploring how we can contribute to um, a just and regenerative economy, both locally and globally. Oftentimes people have referred to these as anchor institution strategies. How do we you know, hire local, procure local, um, use our, our institutional power to support um, more regenerative economies, collaborating with our communities um, to make sure that Northeastern is being a good neighbor and um, working in support of and in service to our community goals set by both, you know, city of Boston and our local neighborhoods. And then also leveraging our research and academic strengths to advance just and equitable solutions to the climate crisis. So I'm very excited about the opportunity here. Um, and we are in the process of developing a climate justice action plan for the university. There's been some work done already organizing and, and engaging with the NU community, so students and faculty and staff. But what we're really trying to focus on the next steps here is to engage our neighboring communities, particularly uh, frontline communities. And um, one of the first things that we're doing is this, again, kind of reflecting back on those lessons learned, this commitment to racial equity. So we're working closely with our uh, chief inclusion officer. Um, we've done trainings internally as a team on having conversations about racial equity and racism. And we hope to continue to do more uh, trainings uh, specifically around climate justice and racial justice once we create uh, a climate justice and action planning steering committee. And then um, on the building relationship front, one of the first things that I did and I'm still continuing to do uh, here in my, in my role is just getting out in the community and getting to know people as much as I can, um, learning, we did a lot of sort of research exploring is what are the priorities and concerns of community and, and trying to do as much as we can on our own time to learn um, from these communities and our neighbors and frontline communities um, so that we can, when we do engage them in this planning process, 
um, which we hope to do through more formal partnerships and really hiring uh, these communities and supporting their own organizing um, efforts. But we can do that from a place of deeper understanding. Um, and this, these more formal partnerships, um, right now we're exploring how we can use the funding that we have to develop this plan to support community organizing in like Roxbury and other adjacent neighborhoods. Um, and uh, really trying to not to center these communities in the work and not center Northeastern and Northeastern's needs. Um, and there is a direct line or correlation. If we have um, supporting the organizations um, in our neighborhood to be organized and to have clear priorities and strategies and plans around environmental justice, we are then Northeastern is in a better position to respond to those um, priorities and concerns. So we're very early in this process, but um, hopefully that is uh, helps give some context for how we're, I'm thinking of applying some of these lessons learned in, in this new role. I will stop there. Thank you again, Leah and Emily and Elder for your presentations and your words of wisdom. So we do have uh, opportunity now for some questions. Um, Rafe, I think you had mentioned that you have a question. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you this, to the three of you for all that. I, I've kind of been maniacally writing down these notes. <laughs> so, and thank you for the references. Um, it's It's been really great today. So one of the questions I have is uh, a, a question I get a lot in small cities that are in the process of putting in a sustainability office or you know hiring a coordinator. Um, you know the idea of silos has come up again and again. Uh, one of the markers of small and mid-sized cities is the lack of capacity, right? That people are doing a lot of different jobs and they, collaboration is really hard when you're at full capacity, right? Because it takes all the you know all the kind of um, personal meetings you're, you're asking people to do, and you've been describing here, the listening, the shifting of, of language, all this is, is work and effort that often feels like it's piled on top of other work that you're doing, even if it's essential. And so I guess <clears throat> the question I have is, as a S Office of Sustainability, <clears throat> which by its definition has to be sort of wide ranging and you know, you're, you're dealing with energy, you're dealing with sociocultural issues, you're dealing with funding, you, know, you're, you're, you have to be sort of Renaissance people how do you make sure that that office is at the core of sort of city decision-making at the core of a comprehensive plan and not sort of, you know, you get, a, you get your own office and then no one ever talks to you again, like and you're sort of marginalized. And how do you make sure that you're, you're a key part of, of the process uh, going forwards, even after the dust settles and the kind of shine is, is off? Yeah, it's also just relationship and trust building internally. I'm a new director, I'm about, six months in and just kind of recognizing the relationships that we don't have and the uh, specifically with other departments within the city and uh, where we sit relationally, uh, what kinds of, I, I mean, this sounds transactional and I think I, I do need to work on thinking of it not transactionally, but in terms of like, how can we support your department and how can you just, you know, but really it's about building a relationship and ensuring that uh, we are um, thinking of each other and our plans and building on each other's works and, pl uh, and plans um, as we move forward our, our shared goals. I would add that, um, yeah, I would echo Emily's sentiments and, and words well. Uh, I do think also that there are folks who, are really interested in the work we're doing at the Office of Sustainability that work in other departments. And so kind of connecting with some of uh, those colleagues or staff members can help build that relationship and kind of begin some more collaborative work within, within uh, the municipality. Does, does the terms sustainability sometimes get in the way? I'm just, again, thinking of you know, I'm the director of public works and I've been with the city for, you know, 35 years and, you know, there's environment and there's solid waste and there's recycling. And, and then you're saying, well, there's the sustainability and the heat islands and climate change. I mean, anyway, I'm just kind of curious as you have those conversations with other city departments and agencies and kind of the translations uh, work that you have to do. 
I was going to just respond to that earlier um, question. I, I think having worked previously the city of Boston before Providence, uh, I found that the small and even resource constraints of Providence um, to actually foster collaboration in some ways too, because no one has enough resources to achieve their goals. And if you can approach the director of public works um, and say, hey, we're going to help you reduce waste and that's going to save you, you know, money or we're going to save reduce energy costs, everyone's like, yeah, great, go do it, like, let's go. Um, there's sort of that motivation and um, and almost a lack of ability to, sometimes it's, you know, it takes more time to like get someone to not do something than to do something. So it's, it's just, um, I don't know, it's, there's definitely pros and cons, um, but uh, I think, you know, Emily talked a lot about the siloing and, and the, the scarcity, um, and the challenges that that causes. And I think conversely, there are also um, some, some benefits. In my experience, I think the words climate justice um, tend to, so I don't wanna say we rub some folks a, a certain way, but it um, might deter them sometimes. Climate justice or bringing uh, terms like social justice, racism into the conversation can sometimes be a deterrent for some people, if I'm being quite honest. Specifically, white supremacy is something that, you know, um, when we're trying to codify the climate justice plan in the comprehensive plan, in zoning, um, it's gone before city plan commission. Um, if folks haven't gone through the same kind of like work of acknowledging the institutional racism in our system, then, um, especially white people, they're not gonna be okay with the use of the term white supremacy. Um, and so we have to- yeah. A lot of defensiveness um, comes up when you start using those terms. And I think that's why that, that learning piece and that commitment is, is so important. Um, and you know, just to reiterate, you know, the undoing racism trainings that happened early on, there are some great benefits that came from that because there were other uh, environmental leaders, like white traditional environmental groups that participated and those ended up being very helpful allies later on when we were trying to push the plan forward and we, when we were responding to traditional power structures about why they weren't included in the planning process, um, you know, they were able to sort of stand up and say, well, here's why as, as like a third party validator to the process, um, that was incredibly helpful. Well, a slightly different twist here, but you mentioned at the end the, about a regenerative economy. And so, you know, as we started this conversation and based on some of the work that we've been doing through our uh, Greenventory project, it's this really complex intersection about climate resilience, climate justice, and this kind of green economy. So I'm kind of curious where you know, sort of economic development, or have there been some uh, connections with some of the work that you've been doing in Providence, Emily, and Elder, and, I don't know, green workforce development or green entrepreneurship? Well, I can just, I mean, from, from the Northeastern work here, you know, we have some of the ways we're thinking about it, we have workforce development opportunities and we have um, obviously the academic side of things, but the work that we're trying to do with the hub and building relationships with community is hopefully will serve as an amplifier for all those existing efforts because you can have these programs in place, but unless you have moved beyond you know, transactional relationships with community, you're still gonna have tons of barriers to um, participation and, and engagement. So I think they, they really um, go hand in hand. Yeah, I, I think certainly thinking about the evolution of like workforce development programs and how they support the transition away from fossil fuels and um, currently navigating what levers we have as an office to help, you know, upcoming um, industries that are establishing themselves in our community uh, and encouraging them to take a racial equity lens and to establish trust in communities um, and to establish programs or expand on programs that um, provide meaningful work 
to uh, folks living in our community so that they can stay in our community. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot in uh, in our vision for a local and a regenerative economy that um, just will take a lot more relationship building and navigating power structures, um, especially coming from a sustainability office that um, economic development is not our core purpose. Um, in fact, we're trying to change the entire structure of the economy and we'll receive the same feedback, pushback against that um, as we would the concept of white supremacy being embedded in local government. Got it. Um, Ray, if you got one more quick question and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, so um, Emily, you had talked a little bit about the barriers to participation for you know engaging folks. You know, it's again, it's a capacity issue. People are so busy they have immediate needs and sometimes climate issues are perceived as sort of like second or third or you know fourth tier well we'll get to that you know of course not if you put it in the context of like your immediate situation is, is a climate issue as well but what were some of all three of you successful strategies that you had uh, in engaging people and having people to come out and actually participate in in a meaningful way where they as you said were kind of like the leaders of the conversation because i know a lot of cities are struggling with their kind of, um, yeah, in, engagement and empowerment strategies. I, I can just share a little bit really quickly. Um, I think that in this role and, and in my previous role as a director of community programs for the Winnesota River Watershed Council, I had to really, un I understood that obviously communities don't all look the same. And so providing incentives um, for community uh, residents that live in frontline communities, especially if you want like their input, their feedback and their participation is really important. These are folks who are dealing with a plethora of issues, uh, whether it be eviction, deportation, unemployment, illness. And so asking them to just participate at a, on a cohort three or four hours a week or bi-weekly is just not enough. Um, I would say that that, that would be providing incentives is, is crucial. And another part of it is also understanding that like fostering a sense of environmental consciousness looks different with different people of different backgrounds and just in general. Uh, so coming up with a list of strategies on how you might foster that connection uh, to the environment with someone, whether it be tree planting, um, you know, with wildlife, um, uh, art has been a great tool to use when connecting folks to, to green spaces. So uh, I would say using some of these tools and resources might be helpful. Last word, Emily. Uh, yeah, I think just that's those are great comments from Elder and just really taking a more holistic view, the way that kind of the climate justice plan does link climate to dignified housing and to the health of our air and our community spaces and how um, the way that we transition to become carbon neutral um, is deeply embedded in um, the thriving, um, the ability of all members of our community to thrive. I would just quickly add that I think it's really if you can answer the question how do you move from centering what i need either as a city of providence or as northeastern university move away from centering that in the process to how do we center the needs of frontline communities in the process and you will i think get a very different um response and engagement and it is about absolutely about sharing power and letting go and um letting other people lead the process. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your presentations, your insights. It's been exceptional. And I, what I take away from this conversation is that sustainability, particularly for legacy cities, is going to happen at many different scales. There's an inward work that has to be done within city government. There's outward work. Um, but I want to emphasize, uh, I think, uh, Leah, you said it, it's a practice when you're talking about climate equity. So it's something that you have to start with and continue to practice uh, each and every day. 
So with that, Libertad, why don't you, uh, if there's some closing announcements and comments. Sure. So I just wanted to, again, thank everyone for joining us today for what was a great discussion. Um, and just so you are aware, you can catch a recording of this webinar with your, if you want to share with your friends, colleagues, your students, it'll be available in about a week on our event webpage at legacycities.org. And you can also find there the previous um, recordings from our previous webinars in the series, Challenge and Opportunity of Greening America's Small Cities, along with Greening on the Ground, Community Driven Strategies for Achieving Climate Resilience and Equity. And then you can also find them on future, sorry, um, sorry, lost my thought. You can also find them on Future Small Cities Institute on the website. Um, the recordings are there as well. Um, so stay tuned for our Smaller Legacy Cities PFR that's going to be released this fall. And you can also look out for any upcoming program announcements for the Future Small Cities Institute. That is all for now, but thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.